that you'd minister to us, build us up, draw us close to you, and we give you all the praise and the glory and honor in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 You may be seated. Praise be the Lord. Thank you. That was, that was a beautiful song. Beautiful. Thank you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, has everybody had a great week? Amen. <laughs> it, uh, today is the day that the Lord has made, and I've purposed to rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. And hopefully you're joining me with that because uh, uh, God is good. Life is tough. There's no doubt about it. Anybody who tells you different obviously has, is, uh, has got their head in the sand. You know, life is tough, but God is good. In spite of the difficulties, the challenges, God is good. Um, I want to be sh share with you just for a few moments this morning on keeping first things first. Uh, there is a, uh, a quote of Stephen Covey that says, The main thing is keeping the main thing the main thing. And share that with you again. Because it's good to remember that. The main thing is keeping the main thing the main thing. Keeping first things first. There are two essential reasons for our existence. And we can do a whole lot of things in our lives and not line up with those reasons for our existence. And so how essential it is that we know what they are and that we are living in compliance with them. Amen? In Matthew chapter 22, verses 35 through 40, uh, Jesus shares this. <clears throat> One of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him, and saying, Master, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. The two essential reasons for our existence are to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourself. And what I've discovered, uh, I've been at a time of self-analysis. For the last three weeks, as most of you are aware, I went through this uh, COVID-19 virus, and I'm still dealing with the aftermath of, of that particular virus. And uh, it, uh, it took me into over three weeks of quarantine. I was hospitalized 
for one week in isolation. I went through two plasma transfusions. I've had low blood levels, and I've been very sick, sicker than I've ever been in my life. I've always been a healthy person. I practice healthy things. I exercise on a regular basis. I, I lift weights. I, uh, I walk every day. I, I eat the right foods. And yet, I got hit with a sucker punch, it seemed, because I got hit with something that was totally unexpected. And uh, I experienced, I experienced uh, at times, delusions. I went through some, some very difficult times at home, and then also uh, some very difficult times in isolation at the hospital. Um, but it was during this time, and I bring that out, and I'm not going to go into all what I went through necessarily, but it was a time of reflection. And when I looked at my life, which at times I didn't know how long I was going to be here for, when I looked at my life, I recognized that there were certain things that were essential and certain things that were peripheral. And uh, many times, many times throughout my life, I have done the peripheral at the neglect of the essential. And as I analyzed myself under that period of time, I, I've, I've been involved in 35, for the last 35 years, I've been involved in full-time ministry. And uh, I, I have been, I've been utilized to help people, to minister to people. I've been utilized as uh, within the teen challenge structure to help hundreds and hundreds of individuals who are in the bondage of life controlling issues. And uh, I, I realized that uh, I have been in, I, when I looked at my life, I wasn't sorry about or had any regrets about any of my ministerial activities because I recognized that I, I'm a doer. I, I want to I wanna get out and I want to do. I, I have a very disciplined schedule and I, I try to get out and I try to help people and fulfill my responsibilities and obligations. But uh, there was something as I looked at myself that was not where it needed to be. And uh, I, I, I know the prime directive. And the prime directive, of course, is to Love God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. And uh, as I look at my life, I, I recognize that loving God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength is more than just an emotion. It's more than just a feeling. It's more than just our American concept of I love you. It is a, it's a commitment. It's a, it's a surrender of, of my will to God's will. It's a sacrifice in a sense, not necessarily a sacrifice, but an opportunity to, to do what God wants me to do instead of what I want to do. And when I looked at myself along those lines, I, I didn't see a whole lot of failure. I realized that God was certainly the most important thing in my life, the most important person in my life. And, uh, but there was another area of my life that uh, I, I went, as I assessed it, I felt to be somewhat shallow. And that was loving others as myself. Um, I went through a broken period uh, during this time because I... I wasn't concerned about going on a motorcycle ride. The guys leave today. I, have, I haven't missed this motorcycle ride in 17 years. I'm not concerned about going on a motorcycle ride. I'm not concerned about going fishing. I'm not concerned about getting a new house. I'm not concerned about doing this financially or doing that financially. As I assess myself, I ask myself, and God, as God broke me and humbled me, am I loving people the way that God wants me to love them? There's a difference 
in meeting someone. I, I was in the hospital, and uh, my oxygen levels were so low, they put me on the, I don't know what exactly, the, the airco machine or whatever. Is that what it's called, airco? I don't know. I call it the torture machine. But uh, they put me on an oxygen level that was so difficult to even exist. They threw this tube around my face, and then they blew oxygen in. Um, I think right now, you know, fr from the wall oxygen, I think it's level six. I think this was level 50. And it was just a constant. It's like someone took a vacuum cleaner and put it on reverse, connect the hose to your nose, and just let it blow continuously. And so it was, it was torturous. It, it, it felt torturous as I, as I, was, going, as I was going through this. And, uh, and yet, um, I, I finally, a nurse came in. And this is where I'm going with this. A, a nur and I, I recognized that I was being treated as an individual with uh, serious symptoms, serious condition. And there were people trying to save my life. In fact, I was told that if I were to leave the hospital, which at one time I was talking about doing because I was getting a little frustrated, uh, they said, you will never be in another hospital again if you walk out that door. And so I'm on this machine, and I said to the nurse, uh, uh, it was a respiratory nurse that came in, I said, uh, is there any way I can be off the, when you're on that machine, you can't go to the bathroom, you can't eat, you can't drink, and they don't ever want you off it. So it's like, what? <laughs> they brought, brought out a commode, set it, in the, set it in the room, you know, and uh, they put me on no water, no, no food, and uh, it, was, uh, it, was, it was terrible. It was a terrible situation. But I said to that respiratory nurse, I said, is there any way I could get off this, maybe just for a couple hours, and maybe go on the house oxygen? And... Uh, that nurse said, well, I'm here. Let me, uh, let me just, let me take you off it. And let me put you on the house oxygen. And so, uh, so she did. And uh, my oxygen levels remained stable. And uh, she said, well, that's good enough for me. She took me off it, the machine totally. And, uh, but something happened. Something happened even through that situation. I, I, I felt treated as a patient, as an individual in need. At that point, all of a sudden, I sensed that I was being treated as a human being, as someone that was going through difficulties and problems. And uh, it was just something going on inside of me. And I felt like a human being, not just, not just a sick person that needed help, but I thought that that person really cared. The doctor, one of the doctors who uh, was labeled as a tough, tough cookie, you know, by some of the nurses, came into the room when nobody was in there. And uh, she, she got down on her knees, grabbed my hands, and prayed. I was being broken. I was seeing love in action toward me. This church, as soon as, uh, as soon as you knew what was going on, people were calling us. People were coming over to our house, dropping off food. People were ministering to us. It broke me. It's not that I don't love people. And it's not that I don't, but it was, it was a love that was so powerful. It was breaking me. And showing me the importance of having that level of love in my life for others. Um, I, I come to you today, I, I don't come to you, um, I, I, well, let I, me share this very humbly. Because I, I, really, I really believe this is something that the Lord's laid on my heart that I wanted to bring to you. I'm not looking to preach a good sermon. I want to just share my heart as to what the Lord has been ministering to me. Because I know those same truths 
that God was dealing with me, deal with all of us. We recognize the prime directive to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength is an essential for all of us. And I've seen the church get so, become so much part, not necessarily First Assembly, Raytown, but the church world gets so, so much playing church that they forget why they are the church. So much going through church things. Well, we need to do this, and we need to do that, and we need to do the other thing. They forget, and we've forgotten, why we even exist as the church. And we, we exist to give that love unto God. And then, to love our neighbor as ourself, sometimes we do that flippantly. And we do it very shallow. And uh, I think the key is, is that we have to look beyond ourselves. If we want to change Raytown, if we want to change our community, we need to love people with the love that God wants us to have toward others. Um, loving God, as I reflected on this, loving God with all our heart, heart soul, mind, and strength implies obedience. Uh, this, is, this is the key, folks. It's not a feeling. It's not an emotion. It's not something that is self-generated. It's something that's demonstrated. It's demonstrated by your submission and surrender to what God's Word says. To doing God's will even when it's not convenient. Even when it, it compromises your, your desires. Even when it doesn't seem like it's going to be profitable. We do God's will because that is our way of showing Him we love Him. In Scripture, in, in, uh, I, in 1 John, it tells us in chapter 2, verse 5, it says, But whoso keepeth his word in him, verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. How? By keeping his word. His word cannot be on the back burner of our life. God's word, God's truth, God's standards, the things that he desires, need to be the reason we exist. They need to be the reason we exist. We cannot deceive ourselves. We cannot pretend. If indeed we love God and we say we love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, it means that we are willing to do His will and submit and surrender to His will above ours on a continual, regular basis. Surrendering to who God wants us to be. Amen? Amen. We see that so clearly. <clears throat> In, I shared this morning a devotion, maybe some of you saw it, and, uh, from 1 John chapter 5, uh, verses 2 and 3. And it says, it says there this, and just looking at verse, verse 3, it says, For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. For this is, everybody say that, for this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. And then it goes on to say, and His commandments are not grievous. Obeying God is not a martyrdom. Obeying God is not you sacrificing your, your, your goals, your desires, your interests. Obeying God is loving Him. And if you truly love God, His commandments are not grievous. Scripture tells us God loves a cheerful giver. We don't give, as uh, Brother Lamar was sharing, we do not give because because it's a sacrifice, or, we're, or oh no, well, throw a couple dollars in the plate, or do this or do that, because, because it's our way of, of just religiously hoping that God sees, sees our sacrifice unto Him. No, it's an opportunity to give unto the Lord and to demonstrate our love. Amen? Amen. <coughs> there is a link between love and knowing God. There is a link, listen to me now, there's a link between love and knowing God. In 1 John chapter 4, 
verse 16, it says, And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Amen? So what we're seeing here, if we have a relationship with God, if we truly know him, we will have the love of God manifested in our lives. And how is the love of God manifested in our lives? It's through our obedience. It's through our surrender of our will to the ways of the Lord. Now, I think there's many people that have deceived themselves. They have followed a concept that does not line up with the truths of God's word. They have simply uh, many times prayed the prayer of eternal fire insurance. You know, prayed a prayer to get out of hell, to get out of hell free card. And uh, it had nothing to do with a commitment of love. It had nothing to do with a surrender of will. It had nothing to do with a, with a willingness to give God everything because of your love for him. It just had to do with what personal benefit that a person could gain by a simple prayer. Are you with me on this? And unfortunately, that doesn't line up. Because if we truly know God, if we truly have a relationship with him, we will love him. And it will be manifested in that. And so as I examine my life, I recognize that obedience and surrender to the Lord is not, it's not a, um, uh, a, a law, so to speak, it's, it's, it's not a uh, legalistic way of, 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 of just trying to appease God, but it is the actual demonstration of my love as I obey Him. Um, in 1 John 4, 8, it says, He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. The problem here is definitions. And the, pro the problem here is the fact that there's people that use a shallow definition as to what the love of God is. And what we need to recognize, we need to go by biblical definitions. And the biblical definition of love for God is our obedience to His Word, to His ways. Amen? And so as we submit to God, as we surrender to Him, as we turn our lives over to Him, we are demonstrating our love toward Him. And that is, we can't say we know God if we don't have that level of love. People today make a whole lot of excuses. God isn't finished with me yet. I'm only human. And they make a whole lot of excuses. We recognize the frailty of our spirit is encased in flesh. There's no doubt about that. But we also need to recognize it does not change the truth of God's Word. God's Word, God does not lower the bar. The bar remains there. His Spirit lifts us up to the bar. Are you with me? And then, um, loving others. Loving others, because Jesus connected the two. You know, he basically said that if you say you love God and you don't love your brother, it's not real. You, you need to, the, the two are connected. If you, if you can't love your brother as yourself. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 20 and 21, it says, If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. Everybody say, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother, whom he hath seen, how can he love God, whom he has not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God, loveth his brother also. This is not optional. This is essential. And we need to recognize, and, 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 and as we analyze our lives, just, you know, many of you are not going to be on my my diet plan, nor do I recommend it, lose 25 pounds in three weeks, 
Uh, many of you are not going to be on my self-analysis plan. You know, quarantine yourself and be in isolation for three, three plus weeks. You're not necessarily, but as you do, whatever plan that you're on, to look at yourself and to examine yourself before the Lord. We really need to see the fact if we truly have the love of God in us, because that is the essential element of why we exist. And if, if indeed that love of God is in us, it will be not only manifested in our obedience toward God, doing the things that he wants us to do, but in our love toward our fellow man. And uh, the absence of that, the absence of that, and that's why, you know, we're, in, we're into this deal with uh, uh, Black Lives Matter. We're into this deal with uh, riots. We're into this deal with racism. Racism does not fit into this picture. There is, no, there is no way that you can look at your fellow man with anything but love and have a relationship with God. Amen. And it doesn't matter what color they are. It doesn't matter what background they are. It doesn't matter what situation they are. We cannot look at our fellow man with anything but love and have a, a, a real active relationship with God. There's no, no sense in deceiving ourselves. This is the reality. This is the truth of God's word. He goes on to say, My little children, let us love not in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And uh, it's one thing to say I love you. It's another thing to put that love into action. I thank you, Ben, for putting love into action. I thank you, Juanita. I thank you, Rahel. I thank you, all of you. Because when we were in need, you were there. And it wasn't just hope you feel better. It was, what can I do? That's so essential and so powerful as we reach out beyond ourselves to love, truly love, in deed and in action. Amen? In James 1 to 27, it says, Pure religion and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. And so what, what we're learning here is, is that loving others as ourselves means not just a feeling, not just an emotion, but an active compassion that demonstrates itself in what we have to offer. I was overwhelmed. I had hundreds of people uh, praying for, for me and my family. I've had individuals that were fasting, fasting and praying. I've had, I, I've had, we had so many of our, of, our, of our sons and our daughter who had contacted people, and, and there were lists of hundreds of people that were just lift, and, the, and notes, you know, that they would send. Facebook uh, proved to be a real blessing during this time. And uh, just notes of people that were just saying, I'm praying for you, I'm believing for your healing, I'm, I'm, I'm fasting for you. I'm doing these things for you. And it was, it was overwhelming. It wasn't just hope you get well soon. It was people that were willing to go beyond themselves and to reach out with love. And it broke me. It spoke to me. It ministered to me in a powerful, powerful way. And I recognized that how I was ministered to, I can minister to others. But it has to be more than just superficial. It has to be it has to be commitment and surrender and dedication and a willingness to go beyond myself. Jesus, I'm going to tell you a, ch a chapter in Scripture that is powerful. It's Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, Jesus defines what the love of God is, and he defines what love toward our brother is, according to God's perspective. In Luke chapter 10, he starts there, and uh, I share with you uh, from the 38th verse to start with, going through 42. It came to pass, as they went, they entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha 
received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Bid her, therefore, that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful. And Mary has chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. I know what it's like to be a Martha. Martha was serving Jesus. She was ministering. She was actively involved in being, being a servant, being a minister. But Mary was doing something that was so essential. She was sitting at the feet of the Lord. God doesn't want you just building popsicle houses for him, popsicle stick houses for him. He wants you to love him. He wants you to sit down with him. He wants you to hear what he has to say to you. He wants you to experience his presence and hunger and desire it. And Jesus was bringing this out. And, and in Luke chapter 10, it really speaks to us because he shares, with, he shares with us this. Mary discovered this, and this is so essential that more important than serving is knowing and having that intimate relationship with God. We find this in worship. There's some, you know, and I'm, I'm not throwing, I'm just throwing, a, a, a shooting a shotgun, so hitting everybody. The, uh, there's some that worship, and there's some that sing songs. There's some that like the music, and there's some that are entering into a level of intimacy with God that they are just, they, it's, 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 not, it's not the atmosphere, it's the, it's the, the, the encounter they have with the Spirit of the Lord. That should be our hunger. That should be our desire. To enter into worship in spirit and in truth. To sit at the feet of Jesus. And Jesus brought this out. And I, this is not something that I've neglected. It's not something I'm under great conviction for. It's something I try to do on a daily basis and, uh, and, and do do on a daily basis. Is spend time with the Lord. Intimate, personal time. Time when I'm separated from telephones, time when I'm separated from other people, time when I'm separated where I can just spend time intimately with God because I, I, want to, I want to know Him more. I want to have a relationship with Him that's real and that's powerful. And I want to be a Mary. I want to be a Mary, don't you? And then in that same chapter, he addresses another issue because he says... Uh, dealing with being a neighbor or loving your neighbor as yourself. A certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said, What's written in the law? How readest thou? And he answered and said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right. This do, and thou shalt live. But he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise a Levite, when he was at that place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him and went to him. He bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine. He set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host, and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three 
thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, he that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus, and this is an important verse, go and do thou likewise. What Jesus was bringing out here to the lawyer and what he is echoing through the halls of history from Luke chapter 10, loving God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength implies sitting at his feet. It, it implies that intimate relationship with him. And then loving our neighbor as ourself means acknowledging the need and being willing to use yourself to meet it. Being willing to put forth the effort to address the need with your own capabilities and abilities. And this is showing mercy, and this brings glory to God. And so Jesus defined what it really is to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And he also defined what it is to love our neighbor as ourself. Many times I've seen myself as the priest. I've seen myself as the Levite. It wasn't a lack of concern. It was a busyness of schedule. It was things that were going on in my life. And uh, those are times when you and I need to really assess, why am I here? Why am I really here? Am I here to fill my schedule? Am I here to pay the bills? Am I here to just survive and exist? Or am I here to cooperate with my reasons for existence? And to reach out beyond myself and to minister to the needs of others. I close with this. It's not something that you're unfamiliar with. But Paul really brings this out in, in the letter to the Corinthians. He uses the word charity instead of love. Uh, in the King James Version, which I, I like better, personally, simply because it implies action. It implies something beyond emotion. And he says, though I speak with tongues of men and angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. We're a Pentecostal church. We believe, we believe in, the, in the gifts of the Spirit. There's no doubt about it. But the gifts of the Spirit are totally meaningless, according to this, without love in action. Love is so essential. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it doesn't profit me. It profits me nothing. Charity suffers long. It's kind, is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, does not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part and prophecy in part, prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child... I speak as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a dark class darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, and then shall I know, even also as I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three. But the greatest of these is charity. The main thing is keeping the main thing, the main thing. Love. Love is the reason why we exist. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the truths of your word. I pray, O oh Lord God, they've been rightly divided. I ask, O oh Lord God, that you would help us. Help us to be the men and women of God you've called us to be. Our desire is to sit at your feet. Our desire is to love you and to seek you and to be who you want us to be. 
Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father Michelle. Do you know that song? I want to sit at your feet. That's what we're singing. Oh, we're singing. Hallelujah. 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 Praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. As we sing this, as we close in this chorus, let's just, let's not sing the song. Let's worship the Lord. Amen. Let's, let's call out on God. Let's acknowledge His name. Hallelujah. together with other brothers and sisters in the Lord God. So encouraging, Father. Sometimes in these a little bit scary days that we face, Lord, just seeing another brother or sister doing well is so encouraging to us, God. Father, 
my personal thanks to you is the brothers and sisters who took the time, God, to just rip open the roof for our blessing, Lord. Father, sometimes it doesn't seem like much, but it is. It is a need, and people sacrificed and did it. Father, I thank you for this message. Help us to understand what it means. We're desperate to be changed, Lord. We need your wisdom how to do this. Father, we pray that you would um, bless this church. Father, that, that you would help us to love the people that we come in contact. We know that you'll protect us, Lord. We know that you'll guide us. We love you, God. We love you so much. We thank you for your great mercies. In Jesus' name, amen.